<clears throat> no, we've seen this probably a lot. If you go to the mail or you got mail and you might see it, you may have something you wanted to send and you have that particular sticker or decal put on your package and uh, or maybe fragile. You might see the word fragile there. A lot of packages have these on it because it's something we want to handle with care. We make uh, we can make some pretty good application out of this, uh, hopefully, with uh, the thinking about handling with care concerning our souls. There is a way we need to handle our souls, you know, and uh, uh, they should be handled with care. And uh, they we we're going to look at maybe three different things pertaining to the handling with care, then we're going to kind of change gears and look at uh, some ways to, uh, to, to handle the care, the soul, and, and look at Jesus at the end as an example. So when you think about the idea, the, when you think about the soul, and when you think about this idea of, of mail and, and packaging, you know the soul is it has a trip to make you recognize that i mean the soul is is on a journey if you will and so <clears throat> it has this trip to make and 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 we some people may or may not admit that i don't know uh, but the bible teaches so and in genesis chapter uh, chapter 35 in verse 18 the bible says and it came to pass as her soul was departing that would be uh sarah that she called his name, uh, I, I, I may not be wrong on the, the I might have been racial, but his father called him Benjamin. I think it was, I think it was, it would be racial. I have to look at the context, I forgot. Forgive me, I'm not inspired. But, but my point is, here is, a, here is a person whose soul was departing as she died. And so we recognize then as we read that passage of scripture that when death comes, the soul departs from this body, and it goes on that journey. And so we, we recognize that idea. Then Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. He's talking about life. He's talking about the body. And the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So you see, you're on, it's, on a, it's on a journey. It's on a trip. And uh, the Bible bears that out as you go along and study it. And Genesis 3.19, back in the outset of the creation, God said to Adam and Eve, in the sweat of thy Adam in particular here, in the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and dust shalt thou return. So there's just a few verses on that. There's more, but you get the idea then that when you know the soul is particularly on a journey. And we also think about the fact that the soul is very valuable. And we'll look at that a little bit more in a second. But you think about it's a very precious commodity. And uh, we should not neglect this watchword here, this handle with care when we're thinking about the soul. And uh, it's in the UPS truck, so to speak. And we, when it gets to its final destination, we hope it don't look like that. Now here's a box that's got that sticker all over it. And that thing's been kicked down the road and tossed and turned and set on and and uh, I guarantee you Jenna used to work at UPS and she can tell you some stories about fragile packages and how they were handled so here are this and imagine we're making this represent our soul and it's on that journey it's in the UPS truck and when it gets to that destination and it's uh, and it's delivered we don't want it to look like that we certainly don't want our souls to be all crumpled up and damaged. So that's the kind of thinking we got here. Handle with care our soul. So number one, we handle with care 
the soul and it shows and it really implies that there's some value involved in it. And somebody's going to say, well, how valuable is the soul? And, and uh, can I tell you, you don't know? I can know it's valuable, but you know that God never really put a price on the soul. Jesus never put a price on the soul. You say, well, yes, he did. No, he didn't. He told you how, that it was more valuable than something, but he didn't tell you how valuable it was. But he did say this in Mark 8, 34 and 37. And when he called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, he, he gives you a little implication about how valuable soul is worth more than the world. If you gain the whole world and lose your soul, he said, what have you gained? Nothing. And so we get the idea that it's, it's, uh, we could say then, can we say that the soul is priceless? The soul of mankind is priceless. You can't put a price on it. You just can't do it. And Jesus really, just he gives you a little bit of a glimpse of what the God of the heaven thinks of the soul. He says it's worth more than the world. If you gain the world and you lose your soul, you know, you hadn't gained the thing. What does it profit you? He begs the question. And it, we know the answer. Nothing. And so we get that. The soul is worth, worth so much. We, I tell you how valuable we can know one way it's valuable. It was worth so much that Jesus came from heaven to save it. Didn't he? And Matthew 1, 21. And she shall bring forth a son. Now this is uh, the religious world's Christmas verse which is, you know, they've, they've totally left, taken that all out of context. This, but this is the great verse that everybody hears. You don't hear this at Christmas time, right? The Bethlehem scene and the banger scene. You don't hear this then. But it's in the Bible forever. And it's, and it's in the Bible for a reason. And the reason is we, God wants us to know that he sent his only begotten son to save us. And he, she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. And then you look at Luke 19, 10, <clears throat> for the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which is lost. That was his mission. That was his goal, to come and seek out the lost. And isn't that the wonderful thing? But what are we talking about? We're talking about the fact that it, the soul of man the spirit of man is so valuable to God that he was willing to sacrifice or to offer his only begotten son to come to this earth and die on the cross for us, which brings us to our next point. He was willing to sacrifice Jesus. And this is our, everybody knows verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God was willing to sacrifice, to offer his only begotten son. And he would send him to the earth to do so. And then look at this verse. God commendeth his love toward us. That he showed his love in sending his son. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, he didn't come to save saved people. He came to save the lost and God shows his great love and mercy in that he would sacrifice his only begotten son. Now, I can't imagine that. and You can't either. You can't, I, quit, I can't imagine giving my son to save somebody. We wouldn't do it. We would not do it. Ever. But God did. He gave his son to save us. Well, that lets me know I'm pretty valuable. Everybody's valuable to God. Every soul on this earth is valuable. God, remember last week we said, God does not want any soul in hell, ever. He wants it to be empty. 
He wants heaven to be full and be with him when this life is over. Valuable. It is so valuable that Christ followed through. Now, we know he didn't have to. He could have wavered. He was a human. And so he loved us enough. It was our soul is valuable enough that Christ followed through with God's will and died on the cruel cross of Calvary. And I love this passage of scripture. Paul t- talking to the brethren at Corinth. You know, somebody was talking about what was one of the most read books in the Bible or what is the most read books in the Bible. And it would be, somebody said, well, it was Genesis, 1 Corinthians, and Revelation. Genesis is because it's the first one you come to. And Corinthians, because of all the smut that you can read about there, everybody's always excited about reading about all the garbage going on there. And it's really, really exciting. But I'm telling you, it was, and that's pretty, that's shameful, but that's just the way it is. And Revelation, of course, that's where you go over and get all your end time stuff. And that's all out of whack too, by the way, with most of the religious world. But back on track here. Here is Corinthians. And I said that because there was all this turmoil and all this sin and all these problems going on with the church at Corinth. And you say, well, how terrible, how bad, those sorry Corinthians. Well, they just folks. They was having their troubles. They was having their problems. Paul says this reminds them. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein by you stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for, uh, for our sins according to the scriptures. He reminded them of the prophets, didn't he? He reminded them of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now all the prophets, according to the scripture, they prophesied about this man that would come and save them. And Paul says, I preached the gospel to you, and you were saved by the gospel And look what you're doing. All kind of problems. Saved. But you know why he preached that? You know why he said those things? Because he knew they were valuable to God. They meant something to God. And when I stand before you and I preach things that may not totally agree with your thinking and it may rub you wrong, listen, I love you and I know God loves you. And I know you're important to God and you're important to me. You're very important to me. Because I love you. And I know God wants us to be saved. And we're not going to be saved by ignoring our sins. We're just not going to be saved that way. Ever. And so here's Paul reminding them of what they'd done to be saved. And he, don't think he didn't remind them of their sins along the way. And he exposed those things. And why? Because they're valuable. They're valuable to God. We are so valuable to God. It... The soul was valuable enough that even enough that Jesus is preparing a place for us. So valuable. God, you know, when Jesus went back to the heavens of, of God in the eternals, he's there. And you say, what's he doing? Well, he's on the right hand of God. And the Bible says he's gone to prepare a place for us. You say, well, it's not ready. It'll be ready. It'll be ready. And... <clears throat> And I hope he's having to build on to it every day. Add another room. Add another apartment. And now I know that's just figurative language. I know that. But the Bible tells us he's going to prepare a place for us. And if he's going to prepare a place for us, here it is. Let your heart not be troubled. Just stop right there. Listen. Is your heart troubled? Is your heart troubled? I thought about that and thought about that. You know, I've read that thing on how many times and just trouble, that idea of trouble just, I mean, just come out at me. Troubled. You know, you can be a Christian and be troubled. Don't think you can't be. We know that. You can be a Christian and all, have all kind of trouble. Troubled heart. I have troubles. 
Listen, my heart gets troubled sometimes. I get all caught up in goofy junk in my mind and I get troubled. What did Jesus say? Let not your heart be troubled. Well, why? You believe in God. And really the, the translation would be, and you believe in me also. Boy, that's a double whammy. You believe in God, you believe in me. Well, what else, Lord? Well, in my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I'd have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Boy, that'll take that trouble away. I'll take that troubled heart right out away from you. If you get in trouble, if you get the troubled heart, just stop and think about this verse. Don't let your heart be troubled. But it's so, our soul is so valuable. Jesus is preparing a place for us to come. Isn't that wonderful? I love that. Number two, we think about handle with care and that idea of fragile, handle with care. It, it shows that the context can be damaged. And it is so true of the soul. Listen, you can damage your soul. And so here is an idea of that right there. Let's just play like that's, uh, that's me there in that box. That box right there. And there's my soul not being cared for. And the, the, the sticker's on there. It's on there. It's that box we just looked at when we started out. That old wadded up box. Look at that. Broken. Shattered. Dreams are broken. Homes are broken. Lives are broken. Shattered to bits. Well, that's your soul. That's, that's a sin sick soul. That's a soul out in the world. Nowhere to go. And, and you open the box, open your mind, and it's shattered. It's just in pieces. It's confusion. Disarray. Yeah. Just go on and make you a list of of representation of a soul that's, that is reeking with sin and nowhere to go. Mishandled. Abused. Broken. The soul can be lost because sin, sin is so damaging. It's just so damaging. Nothing good about sin. As the devil promises other things, it's not good. Nothing about sin, nothing about the world, the things that the world offers us, nothing there is good, nothing. It's going to make you have a broken life and broken soul, damaged. Isaiah 59 2, look at this. This is what sin does. You remember the, bro the, the, the box? Remember the box? Broken. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have, have hid his face from you. And he won't hear you. That's not good. That's addressing somebody with a broken soul, a damaged soul. And you, you've got to get that in. We've got to keep that in our minds. In John 8, 1, 8 21, then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way. And you shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, you cannot come. Boy, I don't like that. I don't like that language. I don't like that verse. I don't like that verse. I don't like it either. But listen, Jesus is not going to tell you a lie. And he's telling these, these men, he says, listen, you think you want to go with me, but you're, not, you're going to come and try to find me, but you're not going to get to go. Because of your attitude, because of your sin. And so the sin, the soul can be damaged. And the sad part of this is, brethren, many souls will be damaged and lost, and they don't have to be. They don't have to be. You don't have to be this way. You don't have to be with no hope. If God has provided you a way out of that. And we got to remember that. Now, number three, handle with care means caution. 
you know, we have to have some caution here. And, oh, now we're, get, we're talking. Now, this is the way it ought to be right here. Here's your life as a, as a Christian. Caution. Boy, I, I, Jan packed that stuff in those. She, she got a whole big old box of dishes in her car right now. She's packed up to sell. And I bet it took her an hour to pack them. She packed that van, put them, all that stuff around those dishes. And look at that. You know, I, re, I like that picture because it's the pearls. And I thought of that passage, the pearl, great price. You know, that's, you know, valuable, valuable. Now, she could have put those pearls in there and not put a thing in there. And they probably would have got there okay. But she knew how priceless these things were. She packed them right, didn't she? Look at how all those little spongy things around it. She's taking care of it. What is that? We're talking about caution. Caution. Take a little caution. Precaution, if you will. Be cautious how you handle the Word of God. You know, we ought to be cautious about that. And the Bible says so. Search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Jesus makes it very clear that we are to search the Scriptures. And why do we do that? Well, I think, uh, I think there might be some uh, idea of eternal life there. It might even talk about heaven a little bit. And it might help me along the life's pathway and, and, and working on my soul. Hmm. You search the scripture for him and you think you have eternal life. And that's exactly why we studied the Bible. We know it promises us that. In John, 1 John 4 and 1, look at this. A little caution here. A little caution. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try every spirit. But try the spirits, whether they are a God. Now, I, we'll talk about this next Sunday morning in our class, and I'll give you a little preview of that. When the Bible talks about spirit, sometimes it's talking about a body, a soul. It's talking about a person. Like we would say, eight souls died, or eight souls perished in that wreck. Well, the Bible does that too. And so he's talking about a spirit. Try me. You know? What, what am I talking about? Test me. Put me to the test. When I preach to you, when we have Bible study, I hope you're listening and I hope you're taking notes and I hope you're going home and I hope you're getting your Bible and saying, I'm going to see if he's right or not. Don't sit there and say, I think he's right. I know he's right. He's a preacher. I know he's right. He teaches the class. No. Always put me to the test. Try every spirit. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets are gone out into the world. There's all kind of garbage out there in the religious world, all kind of junk. And the devil will use it to take you away from God. So we need to lose a little caution. Be cautious who we listen to, John, 1 John 4, 1. Be cautious in our living, Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that you enter not into the temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, I don't know if you think about this or not. The spirit indeed is willing, Jesus said. Jesus said that. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. You know, you're willing. Your, your mind is willing. But you find yourself doing things you know you ought not do. That's exactly what he's saying there. The spirit is willing. But flesh is weak. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We, we've heard that enough. We ought to know that one. But look at this verse. And pay attention to it. What are we talking about? We talk caution. Now look, for the flesh lusteth, lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. That's why we need to use caution. That's why we need to search Scripture. That's why we need to study together. That's why we need to be faithful to God. And that's all those things are caution or precautionary things that we need to put in place as Christians in our lives. Now let's change gears just a little bit.
I'm almost done. Got two more points. Let's change gears and think about this idea. In spite of all the evidence, and that's not all of it, that's just a little piece of it, all the things that we just looked at, in spite of all the evidence that the soul is valuable, it's valuable to you, it's valuable to God, it's valuable to Christ, all those things. And the attention uh, must be given concerning it. We need to pay attention to our souls. Many still are unconcerned about it. So many people are unconcerned about their soul. Unconcerned. Now, I, I want to do this, and I hope I can do it where it makes sense. In the early, I want to say early 50s, mid 50s, along in that area, there was a professor by the name of M. Brewster Smith. And Mr. Smith was of, he, he worked for the uh, Vassar College, and he was in, he was like the head of the Department of Psychology. And he conducted a survey, what he called, of personal values. And it was published in a magazine, still, the magazine still exists, it's the Journal of Psychology. And I tried to find the original article, but I couldn't find it. But uh, it was published in that, so, and he chose a city, uh, and they, they said a, a normal city, but it was pretty large. There's 160,000 people in this city. And he went across uh, uh, three different uh, perspectives in life, so to speak. So he went to the one side of the tracks, if you know what I mean, the poor side, and then he went to the blue collar, and then he went to the a little bit more uh, richer folk. Kind of kind of spread it out, where he'd be fair in his questions. And so uh, he, what they called a cross-section of population. And so here's the questions that he, he asked. One, he said, from your experience, what would you say are the most important things to you? And so remember now, he's gone from one side of the tracks, blue collar, into the upper class. Uh, and, and so based upon your experience, so at least you can have put that, you know, give that at the first step. What sort of things mean the most to you? Now, you ought to, now listen, you ought to think about these and ask yourself these questions now. What things are you most interested in? And then what things do you care about most? And then watch this. 56% stated that economic security was the most important. Out of all these places, from poor to rich. 46 stated home and family was, uh, was most important. Well, that's 46% is pretty good. You think, well, it's pretty good. 25% stated that liberty and freedom was the most important. 13% stated world peace was on the, on the list, but uh, that was where it was at there. 10% stated that education was the most important thing they, they, they thought about. 8% stated religion. Are you getting this? 8% said so that's the most important thing they thought about. Is that good? That's not so hard, is it? I mean, that's down at the bottom, at the barrel. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells me that over half of his survey, the people said that money was their most important thing. E economic security. And then home and family. But you really, if you want to put that in perspective, it should be God, family, economics. That'd be a good way to put it in there. It, you would hope that that would be the survey of what they brought, the fruit that it brought out of. 4% stated decency and morality. And 2% stated being a good citizen. Man, <laughs> 2% out of all their interviews, they well, I don't care whether I'm a good citizen or not, but the rest of it was pretty important. Two uh, percent, and so you have at the bottom of the crux of the matter is the bottom of the the the, the chain, the food chain would be God, decency, morality, and being a good citizen. Out of all that, now why would I say why, what is what is this? It's, it helps us see that in spite of 
all the things that evidence we have of the value that God puts on our souls, that people are ignoring it. They're, they're not concerned about it. Eight percent. Eight percent. That's like almost nothing. And you say, well, okay. Uh, I might want to say this too before we go on the material things. And you might remember the sermon that Jesus gave and he talked it and he preached it. He said unto them, take heed and beware that covetousness for a man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possesses. It's not about what we've got. It's about where we're going and about what God says is most valuable. Well, then you might say, uh, well, what about today? You know, that's back yonder. Back yonder in the 50s. And so I dug around and I said, if I could find me a survey, now, we're all about surveys and polls today, you know. That's what we're talking about in the religion and in the, in the politics now. Everybody's talking about the poll, this poll, that poll, you know, you know, the Gallup poll, the Gallup poll. You hear that all the time. Well, I went to the Gallup poll. See if I could find something that might help us see uh, what uh, we could learn. Well, what about this? The importance. Now, this is a poll. This is a Gallup poll. And it, the, and it, and it says... Please say for each of the following how important it is in your life. Now notice that it starts out over here not too awful far from, well, it's 2002. Uh, and we'll, I'll show you something in a minute on that. So you got 2002 and about, uh, it, they, so what's the, what's the question? Uh, money. The importance American place on their money. And so... 60, we'll say 68% in 2002. And it kind of went on a steady rise there to not too bad, 79% there in probably about, I guess it's 70, maybe 77% up to 79%. So it didn't change a whole lot over a period of 21 years. Kind of the same. Still, it's still the same basically as it was back yonder, isn't it? In the old poll or the old survey. So you say, well, that, okay, well, that didn't change a whole lot. Then let's look at this next one. Religion. Okay, the role of religion. How important would you say religion is in your life, in your own life? Now, this is a little bit uh, convoluted, but we can follow it if you take pay attention. So look up here. The, the solid line, dark line, very important. The orange solid line, fairly important. And the dotted line, not very important. And so you see here how it starts out. 1965. So my point was, in this chart, it's not far from removed from the old fella back in the mid-50s. You know, only a few years. And so it, and when you look at the very important line, you think, well, that's not too pretty good there, you know. And so you say, well, that's 65 or so in there. And well, they, they got almost 80% of people. This is, you know, religion's important to me. But you have to remember that is the time when we, we make the fame to claim, claim to fame with the church growing in leaps and bounds. And it was one of the largest institu uh, religious institutions on the earth growing. It was the Church of Christ. We was making that big claim about along in there. And so religion was at a boom for people at this particular era of time. So there it is. But notice how this thing declines from, you know, 80% nearly into from 1965 now to 2020. Look how it's declined. 45% in 2020. And, you know, by the way, there's COVID. Uh, and I guarantee you if we had 21 in there, it would dip on down. Uh, even worse. But my point is, but look at uh, uh, fairly important, and it starts out about 20%, and it kind of stays the same, basically, but then it dips down. And then it, uh, it, it kind of stays, it rises just a little. And then uh, not very important at all. We got a little hope there, right? Oh, it bumped up a little. Well, it went from almost nothing to, it went up to about 30%. Does that help you? This is where we at. This is the world that we live in. But you say, oh, oh it's awful. But it was that it was the world that 
Mr. Smith was in back yonder. Same thing, right? Mr. Brewster. It was the same thing, basically. So don't get discouraged. This is discouraging charts and such, but what is the point of this? In spite of the, the evidence that God wants people to be interested in spiritual things, the devil wins out oftentimes. And the, and the proof is there as we look at those technical charts, if you want to call it technical. So lastly, this is it. What can we do? What do we need to do? And as I said, Jesus is our example. We need to look at Jesus. We need to look to Jesus. In handling for the, the handling of our souls, we should ask Jesus and look to Jesus and study Jesus for our example. And we start out by looking at 1 Peter 2, 21. For even here in 2, are you called because Christ also suffered for us. Well, what did he do in that suffering? He left us an example that you should follow his steps. You mean we should follow his steps and, and example as he went to the cross? Absolutely. We should have the mindset to be willing to do whatever it takes to be faithful to God. That's what he was showing us. Remember, I told you he, he came and he was willing to carry out God's orders and go to the cross. And so Peter comes along later on and says, hey, by the way, uh, Jesus suffered for us and he left us an example that we should follow his steps. So that should be enough for an incentive for us to think about and try to study about Jesus in his life and see if we can learn what he would do. And Paul would say it like this, be you followers of me even as I also am of Christ. Well, why was he following Christ? Because Christ left him the example. That's the point. And listen, you can't go wrong following Christ. You just can't mess up doing that. If you follow Christ, you will never mess up. Because Christ is not going to mislead you. And so, some other things. I know that Jesus left me this example of him being about his father's business. Remember, he's lost, his parents lost him. Long ago, he lost him, and they, they got to looking for him and realized he, they, he, they left him behind. Can you imagine leaving your child behind, traveling for a little while? And you start looking, well, where's David? I thought, I, Denise, did you get David? Uh, yeah, I, no, I thought you got him. Well, I thought, well, I thought you got him. And, well, well, he's not in here. Well, we must have left him at Walmart. Right? We must have left him back yonder. That happened to them. You say, what, Sarah? Sorry, parents. No, no, no. No. You know, things happen. And they was crowds. And, but Jesus used that. And they went back to find him. And they found him sitting amidst the lawyers. And the lawyers were just astounded at his teaching and his doctrine and his way that he could answer their questions. And, he, and so they come to him. Don't you know this? They was angry and aggravated and, they, and probably upset that number one, he's probably out somewhere messing around and they, he didn't get on the wagon. And number two, they didn't have enough sense to look and they, they, they faltered in that. And they, they, this situation was just very tense. And he, they get to him and he says this. He said, how is it that you're looking for me? What's the deal? Why, why are you looking for me? Don't you know that I must be about my father's business? Astounded them. And that wasn't talked about anymore. I can use that example of Jesus. I can also use the example there in, in Matthew chapter 3 of his baptism. Jesus was baptized for a reason. It says that he was baptized, and I'm going to read all that. You can jot it down, read it when you get home. He's baptized to fulfill all righteousness. He was not baptized for his sins, he didn't have any sins. But John baptized him in the River Jordan for a reason. And that was, number one, that he could fulfill God's wish in that he had to be baptized under John's baptism. And number two, the Spirit had to come. And he would not have come unless Jesus had been baptized in the River Jordan. Because at that very point, remember, the Spirit came like as a dove and sat upon Christ, and God said, this is my beloved Son, hear it. And so you have this example 
for us. So what in the world does that mean to me? Well, Jesus thought enough of being baptized that I should think about myself. And that's exactly what we do. We teach baptism. The Bible teaches baptism. Repent, be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. I have an example of the Lord being baptized for me to look at and to know that he was willing to do God's bidding and carry on with the ordinances that he was under. I can use that example to help me. What we're we talking about here, taking care of my soul. Precious cargo. Don't want it wrecked. Don't want it scrambled up. We want to put the packing around that precious cargo in that box. And so also I have, a, he prayed. He was, I, I put down on my notes, he's a prayer. I thought, well, that don't really sound right. He's not a prayer, but he is a prayer. But Jesus often prayed, didn't he? And that is a great example. And now, by the way, you want to help your soul? You want to, you want to really help your soul? Pray to God. Pray to him. And there it is, Luke 6, 12. Or Luke 4, 6, 4, 16. Excuse me. That was, that's, I, got, I got ahead of myself in one there. He worshiped right there. Let's go back. I don't want to miss that point. He worshiped God there. Right here. He was a worshiper. He put worship in the forefront. He was always worshiping. And he was always looking for a place to worship. And, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and he was as his, as his custom was. <coughs> you ought to put your circle around that. As his habit was, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. That's what we do, right? You know, I don't, we don't call it habit. It's okay. My habit is to get up and get ready and come to worship on Sunday morning. Ain't nothing wrong with that. That's a good habit. Uh, if you're going to have a habit, that'd be a good one to have, right? I uh, Get ready and come to worship every Lord's Day. And the Bible says his custom was he went and he worshiped. So he was a worshiper. He put worship in the forefront and then pray. He was a prayer. He, he prayed often. You, you, you don't go very long in the New Testament, especially the Gospel accounts where you find Jesus praying. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer. Have you ever prayed all night? I've never prayed all night. I know probably I, I tried and go to sleep just like the disciples did in the garden. And he said, well, you couldn't watch for an hour. You know, but I've never prayed all night. I've needed to pray all night. But Jesus prayed all night. He was, a, he was a man of prayer. Don't you want that example? What a wonderful example that we can find for the soup for the soul. Help for the soul here. He also, not only was he a prayer and was he a worshiper, but he, he resisted every sin possible that, that was hurled at him, just like you and I. Everything we're tempted with, Jesus was tempted with. Every sin that you can go ahead and conjure up in your mind that you've ever had to deal with in your short life. Jesus done it twice. And then you can get old. If you live to be a hundred, whatever you face, whatever you come in contact with it's in relation to sin, Jesus done been there and done it. Hebrew 4.15, our study. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. Yet, without sin, he resisted sin. And that is our great example, right? Now, you might think that uh, all these things are, uh, you, you may be familiar with every one of these points, and I hope you are. And I hope that it's helpful to you. Now, no matter what your problem. Whatever your problem is, we all got problems. So whatever your problem is, Jesus faced it. And I think about it, when somebody said, "Well, I got all these. I got authorized, man. I got up this morning and my shoulder, <laughs> my shoulder was hurting so bad. I thought, man, I'm gonna have to have this thing sawed off." And my back was hurting, and my knee was hurting, and I was just hurting all physical ailments. 
You say, well, I don't think Jesus ever suffered with arthritis, but I tell you what he did do. He hung on a cross. Physical, physical ailment. Listen, he, he suffered physical pain many ways. Somebody say, well, I'm just eat up with grief. And remember, I, I just can't, you know, I can't get over this. I can't. Are you grieving? Or let's remember the shortest verse in the Bible. You know what the shortest, shortest verse in the Bible is? John 11, 35. Two words. Jesus wept. Look at that. Look at the context. Go home, write that down, go home and read it. And look at the surrounding text of that and the emotional grief that Jesus went through. He grieved. He grieved over his brethren. He grieved over his, the, his message that people would not listen to. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He grieved over them. So don't think that you're grieving and that God and Christ hadn't grieved. He's grieving. He grieved. You say, well, I got one. My finances, man, my, I, I never have enough money for the, you know, I, the, the, the end of the month comes before the end of my paycheck. Right? Or for my paycheck. The end of the month is gone and come and my paycheck ain't got here. That's the way it works, right? Man, I just don't ever have enough money to make ends meet. I just, it's always so tight, and I just, my finances just, ain't, I, just I don't have it. Now, I know Jesus didn't have to worry about no finances. Is that right? You say, well, maybe not, but I tell you how, you know how he lived? I'll show you how he lived. Right here's how Jesus lived. Jesus said unto him, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Hmm. He didn't have a house. He didn't have a fancy vehicle. He didn't have a, any kind of a riding animal. He didn't have anything of those things. None of those. So if you want to whine on about your finances or we want to cry about my paycheck being too little, think about Jesus. Think about what he said. Think about how he lived. He was just an average, poor carpenter's son. Didn't have anywhere to lay his head. Uh, <clears throat> have you had friends to mistreat you? Forsake you? Backbite? Talk behind your back? You know, all those things. You know, friends will do that. Your best friend sometimes will talk about you. You don't believe it? It's the truth. It, it just happens. People say things. People run their mouth. I run my mouth, okay? I always put it at home. I, I say things and I just, before I walk away. What in the world did I say that for? Why can't I keep my stupid mouth shut? You know? I don't know how many times I say that a week. Two or three times a week at least. Boy, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I could keep my mouth shut. Just, and I pray to God right then. God help me keep my mouth shut. But friends, you know, you don't expect friends to do that. You say, man, I tell you what, that's got, I got one on Jesus then, right? I know that. He had friends. No. It's not the way it worked. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him. Fled. Betrayed him. All of his friends. All of his brethren. Even his own fleshly brethren did so. So we don't have that. And then one more. Then we're through. Well, somebody said, I, I tell you what. I was misrepresented. Man, I tell you what, they just didn't tell the right story. Right? You know, I've had that happen more than once. I've had the wrong story told about me and not even close to the right one. But have you ever been misrepresented? Yeah, I have. You say, well, I, they lied about me, misrepresented me, but Jesus, you know, well, we don't have that on Jesus either. Look at it. Matthew 26 and 57 through 6. This is it. This is the close. And they that laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas. Now watch it. And the high priest where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed them afar off in the high priest's place and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now look at it. Now the chief priest and the elders and all the council sought false witness 
they didn't just sit there and people start coming in and volunteering all this false information. They went out and rallied for it, looked for it, sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death and couldn't find any. Jesus, uh, uh, yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. Isn't that something? Listen, you won't care for your soul. I do. I want to care for my soul best I can. And we can do that by following Jesus. Jesus' example. That's the best way we can do it. And study the Word of God and help one another do it. And so I've already told you about baptism. Baptism is for the remission of sins. We know about it. Hear the word of God, repent it, confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and be baptized with you. It's not any more complicated than that. And you can be a new creature. We talked about creatures this morning. New creature. All those sins pass away, gone. God says, I'll throw them behind my back. Throw them in the sea. Never to be remembered again. Important. <clears throat>